Brooklyn has been great. I mean, now, I want to say that, um, and it kind of came up in the last panel, uh, one of the questions about, well, how do we communicate these stories? And it is the reason that we're videotaping these panels and that for everyone who has registered, and I think all told we had around 130 or 135 people registered, you're going to get links to the videos from the different panels. And then it's really up to you to share these out uh, to your own networks. Because I do think, as we said at the top, that um, these were some different points of view that have been offered on the issues that we're facing here. And uh, as part of thinking through what we've experienced, I wanted to organize this reflections panel with two super smart people, um, both in, in research and practice. Uh, Dr. Byron Johnson is a visiting faculty with us at the School of Public Policy, directs something called the Center for Faith and the Common Good, also has a uh, full-time appointment at Baylor, does a lot of research on the uh, influence of faith-based organizations in the delivery of uh, social services, has um, done some work here in California, but also around the country, has also done some work and some exciting work forthcoming in the field of what's known as human flourishing and what constitutes human flourishing, doing a, a very uh, interesting project with some folks at Harvard. They have a center uh, on human flourishing. So um, might, might talk a little bit about that here. And um, Robert Marbot, who is connected to me by uh, Matthew. And when uh, I invited Matthew first to be a part of the panel, he said, well, if I'm coming, you got to get this guy. <laughs> and i um, just so delighted, Robert, um, your experience uh, and background on this issue um, from the federal level all the way to the local, you served as essentially, and I, I'm sure you hate this title, uh, the homelessness czar in both the uh, last administration and this one. Um, so uh, working at the federal level on these issues, but also um, have done a fair amount of research into uh, homelessness as well. So want to leave some opportunities for questions, also understanding that we're going to have plenty of time for uh, conversation after this, but maybe, Robert, just to begin thinking back on the, on the panels, what were, say, three or four things that jumped out at you as, as things that you were either surprised by or intrigued by or disagreed with vehemently? Um, what were some of the, the things that jumped out at you? Well, uh, first off, I think we got to thank you and, and Pepperdine for putting this together. Yeah. I mean, this was just amazing today. Yeah. It, 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 you look at the brain power you put in a room. It, I'm so glad you got it videoed so you, you can have it have legs and, and extend. Um, what, what, Stephen, where's Stephen? I lost him he, he there. Okay. This double standards that he talks about, it just goes through layers and layers and layers. There's no other public policy in the federal government that we treat homelessness so different than anything else. Think, think about a Pell Grant. Would you run a college Pell Grant, which is the number one grant system in America, would you say, you know what, don't worry about your GPA. You, you, you can, don't even have to go to class. I mean, you know, so heck with the GPA, don't go to class, but we'll send you five to $6,000 every semester. How would a Pell Grant work? in the country. If we were to do unemployment insurance and say, all right, we're gonna do no classes, you don't have to search for a job, we'll keep sending you a check, and by the way, it won't be limited to five years, we'll let you do it forever. We don't do that in unemployment insurance. We don't do that in TANF. We don't do that with Pell Grants. Yet with homelessness, we say, come in, we'll give you a housing voucher, and we'll have you have it unlimited for life, and by the way, if you have all these other things, we'll actually move you to the top of the list. And we expect you, and by the way, there are going to be no requirements for treatment and recovery. We have requirements for Pell Grants. 
We have requirements for unemployment insurance. We have requirements for TANF. Why shouldn't we do that same if we're going to run a, a federal government? So that whole double standard conversation that, that mm. Stephen talked about yep. is just amazing. Uh, what Michelle talked about on requirements, it went in 20, before 2013, when a housing voucher was given, it was given with requirements. You had to have requirement. In fact, that's how you got the grant was a requirement. Now we say, don't go in, uh, we're, you can't have treatment requirements, you can't have service requirements, you can't have, you know, go to class, you don't even have to meet with your case manager, but we're going to give you a, a, a free voucher, basically. What we've done in the homeless world is made it Section 8 housing with no rules. That's what's really functionally uh, going in, and the point of, of requirements, and uh, the uh, Andy Barr, who I think is the smartest elected official in America on this issue, congressman from Kentucky, he's come up with the Housing Plus Act, and what he wants to do is be able to say at least 30% of the HUD money going out can go to a faith-based group, can go to a group that has requirements, that has services, to, to the point um, that the mayor talked about this, Matt talked about it, a couple other people talked about it. If, if you know, the AA program works, a, you know, Al-Anon works. We know it works. So why would we say, like, can you do that program without faith? I mean, that, that, that was such a great conversation you had in, in the earlier panel. And you need to be able to allow some ability uh, to have that. It may not be the only program. I, I don't think you want to allow proselytizing and such. But to say a program works, why wouldn't we want to do that? I mean, the federal government now is spending three times more money on this than 2013. And as a quick reminder, uh, the, in 2013, when housing came out first, this is what the report, when the document came out, you can go read it, we can get it for you if you want it. In 2015, all veteran homelessness went in America. Zero. Not functional zero or playing a game. I mean, really it. Chronic went in in 2016. And before the pandemic uh, that, that hit, all family, would, uh, all family and children homeless went in. And by the way, all homelessness went in in 2023. Uh, it's doubled in some categories, tripled in some categories, even though we've spent more money. So, so that double standard, the numbers uh, uh, that there is, is go. Hmm. Ch last one is, a lot of people talked about treatment and recovery all through the day. T today, we have made government policy, which then people who follow the money and then the policy and then the state of California gets in and then they say, if you want to match it, LA County has to, LA City has to. We have made it now so easy to get high in America and so hard to get treatment. And we got to flip that on the head and we got to make it easy to get treatment and hard to get high. But that's not our policy of our land, and that because the federal government sets that policy and then it, it triggers down. And so many talked about that uh, ability. We need to lead with treatment. We need to lead with recovery, which got to the, there was a lot of conversation about scaling. Hmm. I find it fascinating. In San Antonio, we have a facility called Haven for Hope that I was the founding president of. We have 2,500 people in treatment tonight. If you go to our facility right now tonight, we have 2,500 people in it in San Antonio. And there's not a facility even close to that size in LA, and LA spends mm -hmm. billions of dollars mm -hmm. uh, on homelessness. Billions of dollars. San Antonio pays like probably, I've never figured out, 160 of it. And we have a facility with 2,500 people. We've learned to scale. We have 180 partners on campus. Uh, we have the federal government, the state government, the local government. We have faith-based, non-faith-based, faith-aligned, faith-adjacent. We got everybody working together in one place, which this whole conversation about you can't share data, I think is one of the most asinine conversations. Mean, well, the federal government has a whole bunch, but um, all you do is sign a waiver. We sign a waiver at our place. We share all the data across, and about every eight thousand person who comes through says I don't want to sign the waiver. Mm. So for 7,999 people it works for and the data gets shared and everybody knows the data and such, 
And in San Antonio, it, you know, that whole leadership question. In San Antonio, everybody knows who our leader is. It's a lady named Kim Jeffries. 85% of the people who go through in our six county area go through a facility that Kim Jeffries is the CEO of it, and we know who our leader is. She is our leader. And this mm -hmm. idea that you can't find a leader after somebody has a six month research project and can't find out who the leader of LA is, mm -hmm. that, that's just nuts. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, Peter Drucker always talked about, I went to the Claremont Colleges and Peter Drucker always talked about what gets measured gets done. And right now we're measuring how fast we give you a key to a room, not how good your recovery is. Mm -hmm. We fit, measure how many apartments we can turn not do you become self-sufficient. Yeah. And until we make those Michelle's changes, point. it's not going to work. Yeah, I, I take that Michelle's point was um, not numbers served, but numbers who no longer need service. And that kind of brings me to you, Byron, as, I mean, you both research in these areas, but as a research question, well, first I'll ask, what, what were a couple of yeah. the takeaways first? But then I want to get to this question about are we even researching the right things yeah. here? Well, let me just say, I have been blown away by today. Me too. And I feel totally inadequate to be up here. <laughs> and I mean that. I really do. Because the people that you've been hearing from are the, the champions, really. And one of the things that I've tried to do over the last 25 years is to find people like we've just been hearing from mm. and to see if there's a way in which we can come alongside of them with research. The problem is at universities we need grants, we need big grants, right? And most of these organizations don't have those funds. So I do enough big grants that I can do some of these case studies mm -hmm. on programs like the ones that you've heard about today. And I just love it. I just love it because what you've heard, the people you've heard from really are the people that undergird civil society. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so as a researcher, I like to think of the counterfactual. Where will we be without Jim Palmer? Where will we be without Michelle? Where will we be without Robert Margaret? It's, I don't even want to go there. It's mm. a nightmare. Mm. And so um, as much as we are able to begin to have conversations where eggheads like me can be in, in the room and uh, be able to help tell some of these stories, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I'm not even fit to be up here because <laughs> I don't know this area. I did one study on homelessness and it kept me awake forever because um, I thought, well, if I'm going to do a study on homelessness, I need to read the HUD literature. Yeah. And so I read the HUD literature, and once I read it, the thing that just broke my heart was there was not even one footnote in any study I read that was basically patting HUD on the back, by the way, not one footnote to a faith-based organization, mm. not a chapter, mm not a paragraph, mm. not a footnote. But yet when you go out into the field and you talk to mayors, you find out that they're really aware of people like these. Mm -hmm. They know what they're doing and they embrace it. And so um, we, we have so much work to do. Um, it's, it's a bit overwhelming. Yeah. And um, the fact that we're having this meeting today is important. Um, right yeah. with LA as our backdrop. Um, so I'm just thankful to, to rub shoulders with the champions that are in this room. So I've been affected by today. Um, I would be boo-hooing, but I didn't bring any Kleenex. Um, <laughs> but it's just, just so powerful. Um, and um, you know, I'm, I'm studying a, a prison right now in Mississippi. Um, it's a notorious prison. It's one of the worst prisons in America. Um, built on a plantation, and I did the same study in Louisiana. And one of the things that they're doing there, uh, Brian, is peer-to-peer, -peer, where the inmates are transforming the prison themselves. And I saw it happen in 
Louisiana and Angola, another terribly corrupt, violent prison where they transformed the prison. And so as I began to document the story, we, we did this with heavy duty statistics. We published a ton of papers on it. But we realized that you couldn't transfer this because they were training inmates to be ministers to pastor churches in the prison. Mm. Wow. But none of the other states would allow it. Wow. You know why? Because there's a policy that inmates can't have authority over other inmates. And to have a pastor would be to have an inmate in authority. And I'm thinking, OK, but you just told me that there were a bunch of gangs in this prison that are basically right. running the prison. and so. You know, that's okay, but we can't have inmate pastors that are doing grief counseling and sidewalk counseling and all these other things, too. So we, we have a long way to go, um, but I do think from, from Pete's point of view and Robert's and mine, it's like we need to document everything we can possibly document and I, publish and publish and publish because one, one study does not a literature make. Well, I, I wanted to go back to this point because obviously one of the running themes from a policy perspective that's being been debated and discussed uh, throughout the keynotes and the panels has been the housing first approach. And I, I must say, I, I think it's been a very balanced conversation mm -hmm. about it. But one of the things back to the double standard piece that Stephen raised in the beginning is the double standard on what is necessary from a research standpoint to prove one policy approach versus another. And I wonder from your perspective, Robert, I mean, uh, how much bias is baked into policy research in this area of homelessness before you can even get to a place where invest, you know, deeper studies into work that Matthew's doing or others really could become better known and promoted from a research perspective, not just a narrative perspective and articles, but from a research perspective. The, the bias is baked in in the numbers just coming out of the federal government. And yeah. when, when Paul Webster and I arrived at the White House about the exact same time within about a week of each other, and we brought in to, to sort of make some changes and such, one of the most fascinating things, most people don't realize, federal government has 10 definitions of homelessness. Five under Department of Ed, five under HUD, they track all 10 cohorts. And if you look at it, a game is played almost immediately with the numbers. Mm -hmm. just, uh, just immediately. It's when it benefits this study, they'll go there. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't benefit it, they go here. And so there are 1.5 million people experiencing homelessness at a department ed. That was the number pre-COVID. They've lost 300,000 people that they can't find. And so that's the number in department of ed. Five groups equal 1.5. Department of HUD, at Housing and Urban Development, has 1.2 million people. And you never hear that number. But then you hear the 650,000 number, which is underneath the 1.2 million mm -hmm. people. And that's what you would probably call a street, well, Paul and I and others call it street level homelessness, in and out of a facility and literally on the street. That group by the White House's number is at a doubling rate now every five to six years. Mm. Yet that's what they put out in the report. And then they said, but you know what? That's all about uh, who, the, the, uh, the, the lady here, uh, I, I forgot her name, but she was sitting here going, this is what LASA has on their website. Yeah. But the largest single so study ever done on homeless is Cal Policy, 64,000, UCLA, Berkeley, yeah, UCL, well, sorry, UCLA and Berkeley. And they, if you go, that's a required reading assignment. I think there should be three, three or four required reading assignments. That, Judge Carter's uh, uh, first ruling uh, is required. Cal Policy Lab is, is, is another. Um, and what that said, 64,000 people study said 50% self identified on the street as saying alcohol and substance abuse. Another 50% said, and obviously overlapping, said self-report, we all know self-report's under, said it's mental health problems directly led to my loss of housing. Mm -hmm. Yet the federal government says the number is like in the 12, 13, 14%. When you look at their case notes, the number actually goes to 75% and 76%. Uh, at street level. 
So don't play a game and say, well, street level is really not mental health, and, and then family is economic. You, you got to, when you, first thing we should hear is when somebody says, here's a homeless number, which are the 10 numbers? Right. And if you know yeah. that, then you'll know if it's hooey. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because there's a lot of hooey going around here. I'm not sure if we're allowed to say that here, but, but Why? It, 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 because the White House wants to show the numbers are going down in an election year. Right. That's what's going on. And, and they, it, but if you read their data, read the report that just came out two months ago, that, that before we even get to research, there's a game being played on just the raw numbers. So anytime you hear homeless, ask which, which of the 10 definitions, which of the cohorts, is it two cohorts, mm -hmm. all of them, and such. But what we know is four blocks away, this was the epicenter of mm -hmm. the biggest uh, homeless uh, enclave in the world outside of Calcutta. It was right just three or four blocks away, yep. which I love the fact you, you did it here. And, and um, there was some thinking behind it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I still remember Pepperdine 1984 Olympics and watching uh, water polo out on a beach in the campus. So, you know, we got that too. We got that too. But, but this area here mm -hmm. is a huge area. And if, if you go down, it's substance abuse, it's mental illness. That's the whole ball game right, right yeah. now. Yet, LASA on the front page doesn't even mention the top two categories of what's going on and what's doubling here. And so until you even get to research, we got to get the raw data right. Yeah. And so once you get the raw data right, then you can go to, to, to the research uh, and such. But we, we, we got to start with almost something more fundamental. What are the real numbers? Mm -hmm. What are the real definitions? And don't let people play games. It's a, I'm just shocked. I, I've, I've been on so many NPR shows and somebody throws out a number and I said, well, that's true for that one tenth, but mm -hmm. that's not what the questioner asked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The discussion that's been around, uh, it came up in Michelle's talk, it came up in the, in the last panel about this more rules-oriented approach that there really does need to be some sort of structure around admission into shelters um, as opposed to at least some versions of the housing first approach, which is very much kind of here's your key. Talk a bit about what, is that an ideological difference between those two approaches, the belief that, you know, we really just need to have get people into shelters or homes versus some of the kind of rules and regulations that other shelters practice? Say, for example, what Michelle did at St. John's and what's being done in other places. You want no, to? you take that one. I, 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 I'll, I'll talk about research in just a second. I, I want to follow up on something you said, but that's a good question for you to answer. So it, it, I'm passionate about this because I, I ran the largest facility in the United States for five years, got it started and such, and have spent a lot of time in the Salvation Army network, the, the City Gate network. And here's what I know, just metaphysical certainty. A after I've been to 1,600 places in, a, in America, I've never met anybody who recovered living under a park bench. Yeah. I've never met anybody in America who said, I got my recovery under that park bench right mm -hmm. there. In fact, it was what Matt talked about that's almost keeping you right there at the park bench. I've also never met anybody who been arrested and recovered either. Mm -hmm. the, why is it now the number one place of center of, of mental health treatment now is our jails and prisons in America? Yeah. But the reform system didn't work in the 60s. How about the mental health treatment inside a jail or a prison? It's just not happening. I know those two places don't get treatment. What gets treatment and recovery is 24-hour programs initially that you then take less, you know, you might transition mm -hmm. and go to transitional housing. Those programs work. So we should be doing everything you can to get people into treatment programs, not hang out at Park Bench. And this idea that we're going to rest our way out, that, that's crazy. I, I don't know anywhere, I, even the most conservative places in America, judges let you out in under eight hours. 
if you're judgment proof. If, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a civil term uh, used, in a, and I think it applies because judges go, we don't keep you in. Um, the closest best program I ever saw where there was an ideal balance between treatment and police was the SIP program in San Diego that was started out of the EMS department, not the PD. And, it, and you had three credible officers there. I went to all three of their retirements. They, they, they had the three most coolest officers in this entire country in terms of dealt with it. Now mm. you guys got like Officer Moore and Colleen and Link in, in St. Petersburg. But if, if you can get people into treatment, it works. And mm. everybody says, well, do we have enough treatment beds? Well, right now, uh, we don't have enough treatment beds. I mean, Judge Carter's, this is why Judge Carter's initial deal, think about it. after you've spent, after this place, LA County and City County, have literally spent billions of dollars. I, the, it, it was one of the most horrible statistics I read that more people died in LA City and LA County mm -hmm. than housing was done, created. That's what is, is said. That, this is not a conservative judge. This is a liberal judge. And so when he talks about that, um, in, in, on affordable housing, I know we're bouncing around, but uh, Governor Newsom and I were, had a secret dialogue going when I was at the White House until it was on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> and he said, I'm meeting with the secret envoy from the White House. <laughs> and, and I like call up his team and I'm like, what, New York Times? That's your version of secret. Well, we didn't mention your name. And <laughs> so, uh, and, and the deal I was trying to cut with him is he wanted 50,000 housing vouchers. And I said, I think we can make a grand deal if we do 50,000 housing vouchers and you make every new unit built in California not have one tax, not one fee, not one platting cost, not one any government cost, because in essence he was using federal vouchers to pay for local. And in California, when we did a quick study, yeah. It was about $130,000. This is $2020, so it, I'm sure it's gone down to, to do Matt's thing. But $130,000 to start a one knob for any apartment complex, any, any housing complex and such. What would happen if every city and county in California, every special district and the, all the environmental, zeroed out their fees for a new unit? You know what it does? It drops at about 35%, 40%. So if you're going to match federal taxpayer subsidy, why should it come over and pay for all these fees? Yeah. If you want to get serious about affordable housing or that in-between housing, drop those construction fees. Yeah. And I'm not even talking regulation. I'm just talking the actual the check fees. you have to write. Yeah. That's a big deal. Think about that. Yeah. Byron. So um, when you were talking about these 10 different definitions, it, it reminded me of something that we should talk about. So about 10 years ago, um, a professor at the University of Virginia was troubled by a lot of the research that he was reading. And so they requested data, and they replicated 100 studies published in top psychology journals. And in half the studies, they could not replicate the findings. This was published in Science. And so they formed something called the Center for Open Science that said, we need to do things differently. Too many people are faking the data or making it so confusing that you, know, you can do all kinds of jujitsu, yeah. but you don't understand how people are cooking the numbers. Now, of course, this has and this is last year, 10,000 studies that have been published have been retracted in scientific journals. So there is huge fraud in the academy. And so I'm not saying the government is complicit, but if that's happening in the academic community, then what are we supposed to think about some of the data coming out from the federal agencies, yeah. right? And so. I think so many people are absolutely stunned at this level of fraud. And so some of the top professors have just recently been suspended from top schools, including the Ivies, because of this. And so they formed something called Open Science. 
which means in transparency, you share everything with everybody. And you show them how you do this and how you actually conducted the research and make that all available. You don't keep the data hidden from anyone. Mm. And so this is the new thing. People are moving in this direction. I sure hope it happens for the federal government that they too fall under open access so that you can actually go in there and look to say, how did you come up with these numbers? Because we've looked at the numbers and it does not come out that way when we do this. And here's how we did the analysis. So on this new study that, that Pete alluded to on human flourishing, we're studying flourishing around the world. We're tracking over 200,000 people for five years. It's about a $45 million project. It's completely open access. So not only are people getting the data in real time, as soon as we get the data, we are providing to people our own codes, our own syntax of how we're structuring and how we're doing our analysis. So if you were to do the analysis and you get something different, then it, this shouldn't happen. You should get exactly the same kinds of findings. So let's hope that in the few years when we're talking about homelessness and uh, what it means for someone to to not be homeless anymore, yeah, and we have these other met look like. Yeah, what does success yeah. look like? But right. let's look at success in the same way, yeah. so that we understand it. Let I'm just give one example uh, to this. Um, Paul and I were very involved in in homelessness, and the prediction was 50,000 people were going to die from uh, COVID during homelessness, and said. And for a variety of reasons, partly great work of CityGate Network and Salvation Army and the Independents and a lot of technology we did, it ended up a little under 600 people died from mm -hmm. COVID and all of homelessness the day I left, the, when I left the Biden administration. And the, a bunch of doctors, basically very activist doctors, didn't believe the data. They, they like really went after me and said, we're cooking the numbers. So we got in a big debate and whatever. JAMA sort of steps in and does a, an incredible research. So to they tell said, them what JAMA is. Yeah, uh, Journal of American Medicine. And they're on the sort of left to center. They, they, they often are down the line, but left to center. They, they sort of maybe take left topics, but do pretty good science around it. And so they said, we're going to go look at the worst city in the worst state in the worst country in the world, which was San Francisco. Uh, on, on, it's true. That's how they picked it. And they went from the day that Donald Trump initiated the order on March 13th, and they went one year out. And their, um, the doc, I knew some of the doctors on the edge of, of, of not the actual study, but were involved on the perimeter. And they basically said, the, the deaths had doubled, which was true, and they were predicting it was mostly because of COVID, which was, and I, we weren't seeing that data at all, and we had a big debate. So they went in and looked at the corner record of all, and, and here's some of the takeaways in the abstract. The one year after COVID started, the death rate doubled over the highest every year they ever had. It wasn't just over the prior year, it was historically, total true fact. And they, you know how many people they found died of COVID? Zero. This is their study, not my wow. study. Zero study. And it was all overdosed because they were using COVID money to put people into apartments without treatment and recovery. Mm. Wow. And I met with the coroner or the coroner's office about seven or eight California cities during COVID. Everywhere I went, I'd always go to the coroner. And I said, what are you seeing death rate? And he says, overdose. Wow. Number one, and then trauma being hit by cars, number two, while they're on uh, substance. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they, they were out of it. Yeah. And so go read the JAMA. You know, this is to your, your, your point. And I got to give them credit. They, they called it the way it is, but mm -hmm. then now all the that side of the aisle sort of hides that study. Mm. Um, but you can go find that study. And, uh, and, it's, and this shows you what happens when you isolate a substance user without treatment, without recovery. And several people talk to you today, people don't die on the street of overdose because they, they get help. Yeah. Mm. But when you're in isolation, and here's mm. the, the, the last sort of horrible side of this when I was talking to every corner I said, any other, I said, is there any other thing I should have asked you or, or would you notice? He said, 
Uh, the average discovery, anecdotally, was six to 10 days. Uh, I was like, mm. six to 10 days? It was when the body started decomposing That's and a like neighbor that. reported wow. it. Mm. People didn't even know. So I sent this study to a very famous person who's on the TV a lot, on the other side of you know Stephen and I and somebody we all know. And uh, I, he said he hadn't seen the study and I sent it because he was convinced it was COVID death. And he wrote me back one hour after reading the study and literally this is what he said, at least they're dying with dignity. Nice. I, 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 I was dumbfounded wow. at mm. that, that, that. And so this gets to your question. Mm. This is a harm reduction policy gone bad. Yeah. And, and we didn't, nobody brought up harm reduction today, but I think this is harm reduction so far out, out of control that, that this idea that you can die, but you can get high and get drugs and, and do this. And, and it just, it, it's mind boggling to me how we've gotten to this point. So I want to close in the last couple minutes here just with some next steps. First, to you, Robert, um, you obviously were in that position of, uh, what was the title, any, your official title? It, was, it wasn't homelessness. The executive director of the US Interagency Council on Homeless and, and and by the way, your three bosses are, where my starting three bosses were Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, and the President of the United States. <laughs> so if you don't believe in therapy after that. <laughs> uh, and then my last two bosses included uh, uh, Senator Schumer and <laughs> President Biden and, and uh, the speaker over on that. So, so yeah. it, wow. it, it's, a, it's the Good strangest moment. job in the US government <laughs> by far. So it was raised before someone at the other panel um, mentioned that this really, some of these homelessness related issues should be moved out of HUD. Just from a structural perspective, if you had a magic wand to wave over the federal government, what would be one or two of the things that you would like to see happen? Get rid of continuum cares. Yeah. Um, it's just start, continuum cares are just, it, it was designed by a, former Secretary of HUD who is running for president, and if you look at the 400 Continuum of Cares, they almost perfectly match the media markets of the United States. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. They don't meet delivery, they meet how you run for president of the United States, which this person mm -hmm. planned on running for. Mm -hmm. So one is get rid of Continuum of Cares, do it the way we do all our other funding, and but there are a lot of other ways, just get rid of Continuum of Care. And we have to start measuring self-sufficiency as our number one measurement, not how fast we give you a voucher, how many people get out of homelessness forever. Mm -hmm. And if you change that, I mean, Peter Drucker, I know a lot of people call him pop, you know, I, I really think he was the management guru for a reason. Yep. And it, if you, what you measure gets done, and if you measure the wrong thing, the wrong thing gets done, we measure how fast we give you a key and how we keep that apartment filled we don't measure success. And we, true success should be how many people get out of homelessness forever. Yeah. Shouldn't that be the, I know that's a, that should be our number mm. one measurement. So if I could do anything, I'd get rid of continuing cares, change how we measure success, and allow, this problem has gotten so bad now, we need everybody's help. We need private sector, we need faith-based, we need government, we need uh, uh, big companies, small companies, we need faith-based, we need everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea that you say, we're gonna create a new policy, we're gonna stop measuring success, we're gonna stop giving you treatment, and by the way, the two groups who have 75% of the beds, uh, CityGate Network and Salvation Army, we're gonna take you off the field yeah. and you can't play on this. Yeah. Ridiculous. I'm not surprised we're in the shock, and, and, and we're doubling now, and we're just going to keep doubling. And it, it, if just look at the White House's number, not Robert's number, not what an advocate thinks. Right now, we, in 15 years, are going to be at 10, approaching 10 million people on the street. 
We're going to be at 5 million approaching in, in five years here on the street. That's not those other categories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just those two categories of street level and rescue level if we don't make a change. It, it doesn't surprise me one iota when we stopped treating mental health and substance abuse in 2013, it doesn't surprise me at all where we've gotten. Byron, um, last question then, as someone who's done a lot of work, uh, research work for the federal government on federal policies, on state policies, what would, what would you like to see from either the federal government's perspective on how it's funding research in this area, or is it something mm -hmm. that the system is so corrupted it really has yeah. to be funded by yeah. the Templetons and yeah. maybe smaller foundations? Talk about how we get to this yeah. research uh, agenda that, that Robert has outlined here about yeah. what success looks like. Um, you know, I, I run a think tank on religion, so I do a lot of studies on faith-based organizations. I do a lot of study on religion. And uh, early on in my career, I did a lot of work for the Department of Justice that was not dealing with religion. Mm. Um, and then they brought me in um, a number of years ago and said, we're actually thinking of doing a lot of research on religion. And so we wanted to pick your brain about it. I said, great, this is fantastic. And uh, because I had done so much. And then um, they brought in another person too. And that person knew that I was a Christian. And he said, I think this is a good idea too. However, I think whoever we select to do research that has religion as a part of the research should be an outspoken atheist. Because someone that comes from a religious background would come with a bias. Yeah, that's where the bias is. Yeah. Right? Not and, on the other side. Yeah, and yeah. I thought, yeah. OK, so I, mean, I, I was invited to this meeting because I've published papers in, in you know, academic outlets and peer-reviewed journals. And uh, you know, if, you, if you write on religion for academic journals, you get, your, your work is reviewed by peers. So. Um, Every now and again, when I do these kinds of studies, I get a FLR. That's a funny looking review because <laughs> you're studying religion and if you find there's any benefit, yeah. then they, they sniff a problem. And I've had people say, I don't know what's wrong with this paper. There's something wrong with it. I can't quite put my finger on it. Um, so I would love to see, since religion is so prevalent, mm -hmm. And you, you, you heard from some amazing people today, most of whom, not all, but most of whom do this out of faith motivation. Mm. Would, would we want to say, because you're faith motivated, you cannot provide these services? Would we also want to do that? And because you, you, you come from a faith background, we're going to say that you're now no longer able to do this kind of research. Actually, my faith informs helps me to understand how I should ask certain questions and what I might be looking for. So it's value added. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that's been my experience when the, we were talking about the government. So yeah. a part of it is I'm glad that I have to go to private foundations to get funding. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's been easier to do that than to go to NSF. Yeah. Uh, but I should be able to go to NSF. And NSF should invite it. Yeah. Um, because as you saw today, it's so important. We need to understand all of these organizations and there's precious little research on the wonderful work that these people are doing. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Um, thank you all for uh, being here for some great conversations. As I said before, in closing, um, all of who have registered will be getting links to all the videos from these panels in the next few days. I strongly encourage you to share these out. Yeah. Uh, this is the way that you take a room of 80 to 100 people and make it thousands of people uh, because you put that out in your social media or email listservs or whoever your, your networks are. I know there are people in this room that are connected to folks over there in City Hall, as well as the County Supervisorial Building as well, and so making sure that they're getting this information too. I want to thank again uh, Howard Amundsen and our friends at Fieldstead for making this happen. Thank you, Howard.
Um, that banner out there is a little tagline we always use at Pepperdine at the policy schools that you will see public policy differently from here. And that's a little kind of coy reference to our beautiful campus. But it is, <laughs> it is also the approach that we take to policy issues like this one. Um, and, and again, having partners like you, Howard, and Fieldstead to support these kind of unique conversations, bringing together an amazing group of people to host discussions on issues that frankly you're not going to see in a lot of other places, that's gonna look at the role of faith, that's gonna look at the role of, of nonprofits, but also strong government leadership like Mayor, you demonstrated in, in San Diego and others. Uh, we're, we're going to highlight those things in the work that we do. So again, thanks so much for joining us. Please join us in a reception outside and continue the discussion.